We're going to get it kicked off soon, uh, but we have maybe a couple announcements. One of them has to do with advising, and I need to explain to all of you, though some of you already know this, but I need to explain it, that this art seminar, the one, two, three, four, uh, and five, uh, art seminar, we have given those new names. And really briefly, the reason that we gave them new names, not just to confuse you, <laughs> we're actually trying to make it easier for future students, but we have carried the name, for example, 191 for the art seminar, but you have to take 191 in the fall, right, and 191 in the spring. For some students, that has been confusing for, for some time because they thought, oh, I took 191, why do I have to take it again? So we have changed the names to be 188 and 189. So there's two separate ones. You have to, of course, complete both of those for the fall and the spring. But hopefully people that are coming in will get that and they're like, okay, I got to take both of those classes to stay. We've also increased them to one credit, okay? So the, the credit is going to be a bump up from a half credit to a one credit class. I'll be for the same, same amount of time here. Uh, so that's a something a little bit different. There's still some <laughs> hiccups, though, with the actual registration process. So that's why I'm kind of making the announcement here. So what you're supposed to see is that you would just, you know, if you got done with 291, you'd go into 388 would be the class that you'd uh, enroll for, and it should say one credit. Well, that's not happening for everybody for a couple reasons. Wha you may see something that would say, if you just completed 291, you're completing it, and you want to get into 388, it's saying, like, oh, you have not completed 289. You can't get in. <laughs> so... It's like, well, we didn't have that class, but the computer is seeing it as like, this is a problem. We won't let you in. So what you must do, what we, what we know right now, is that we're going to have to add you uh, individually. So you will have to email the professor to say, I got to get into this thing because the computer can't figure it out. So basically, you're going to have to email that professor of that, uh, of that class, and then the email will be advanced to the registrar. So that email has to include, of course, it has to come from your university <laughs> email. That's important. So a few, few of you, sometimes I get Gmail and things coming in, but it's got it, they'll reject it. Uh, it has to be university email. You have to write, okay, can you please add me to, you know, whatever it is, 388, art 388. It has to have the class number as well. You'll see that when you're uh, on your campus connection. Uh, and... Anything beyond that? Is it just the, 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 the credits? So it's one credit. Yeah, one credit, the class, the, um, I think that's the essential information they need to have to add it. Student ID number? Student ID, well yeah, put your student ID number on. That's, that's great. So again, we apologize for this, but it's just trying to move to something that <laughs> we thought would be easier. Got a little bit funny in the middle. I think this won't happen in the future, but this is our semester uh, that we have to kind of transition to that. Okay, so any other questions, of course, you can ask your advisor about that if you're having some, some troubles and uh, get enrolled. Meet with your advisors if you have not already, and let's, let's get enrolled for this summer and fall. So, all right. You heard it from Micah, get enrolled. Um, I have uh, uh, an announcement too, uh, the juried student show. The last day to submit your work for the Juried Student Show is this coming Monday at 5 p.m. Um, we will be there on Saturday, 1 to 5, if you want to avoid the crush, or until 5 today if you want to come in. Um, but just a note, uh, all of the submissions for the Juried Student Show will need to be in by Monday at 5. Um, with that, I'd like to introduce our seminar speaker for today. Um, Dr. Amanda Watts uh, is originally from Minot, and she began her career in archaeology on excavations in North Dakota on the Lewis and Clark Trail over 20 years ago. Uh, her work on objects led to specialization in object conservation, the material science approach to understanding and caring for museum collections, which includes artwork to all you guys. So no more, no more framing your pieces with masking tape or scotch tape, please. <laughs> um, conservation work at museums, such as the Museum of London, Chedworth Roman Villa, Poe Museum of Richmond, and the National Museum of Afghanistan in Kabul, balance her field archaeology expeditions, where she has conserved objects on site in the UK, USA, Turkey, Afghanistan, Rapa Nui, and Egypt. Um, I'd like to give a big art seminar welcome to Dr. Amanda Watts. Hello. Um, 
40 minutes or three short hours, no, it's only 40 minutes, uh, is not a whole lot of time to get into conservation materials. Um, our, our take on the materials that you use when they come into our care. So thinking deep about what you needed from me in this short amount of time was just a knowledge drop so that you're making these choices about materials actively, not out of a place of, oh, I didn't know that it falls apart after five years or whatever. Um, so even if I'm here to actively scare you about certain materials and their deterioration processes. Um, if you walk out and do everything exactly the same way, from now on, I'm happy because you're doing it intelligently. Um, it's not that you didn't listen to me, it's that you listened to me and you made your choices anyway, and I'm cool with that. So, um, we're gonna talk about plastics today because there's, there's just a lot that I would like you to know when you're making your choices. Um, but we're gonna talk about some other super basic things as well, like paper. Not all paper is the same. Um, inks and some of those materials. Uh, it's my little sprinkle about where we could get into binders and carriers and solvents for your pigments for the different kinds of paints. Um, but that's another show, um, which we're gonna my office hours are three days a week. Uh, all right, so conservator's role. Uh, I am here to keep an object together as long as possible. I am not here to fix things. Um, if you make a choice about a material and it starts to deteriorate, my job is to keep it going as long as possible. Uh, and that is my balancing act. I'm not there to think that I know better than you and replace a material because artist intent is very steeped in the ethics of conservation. So, um, after you've had this lecture, you can go ahead and use stuff that's gonna fall apart and that becomes my problem and I'm never gonna question you about it. Uh, but, Part of that is also the deterioration process of access. Art has its value in people being able to experience it. So I need to also balance trying to keep that thing together as long as possible, but getting people to be able to experience it. So access to the material means that it goes on display, the lights are on, it's getting that light damage, it's getting people coming in and breathing around it, which conservators stress about that. Um, it's changing environment, it's getting humidity, it's getting heat and light and all of these agents of decay, but that's what it's there for. So I'm not gonna preserve it forever. Um, we used to kind of have a motto that was, we preserve the past for the future. Um, and some of us, and a growing number of us, have starting to get a little bit pissy about that because it's not always about the future. We're not gonna keep it in a box until some generation that deserves it. What about right now? So that is more of what our job is. We aren't magicians. We are your support as things come into collections, as we try to balance keeping those objects together and accessible and also making them accessible, which adds to that cycle of deterioration. Oh, it's a catch-22. Um, all right, so I would like you to know more about certain materials. Uh, older ones, ones that have historic significance, the artists have been using them for decades, centuries, millennia. We know how they age. Archaeologically, if we find them, you're probably good to go, right? <laughs> um, ceramics, they last forever. Uh, these are actually mud statues with chalk painting um, in Afghanistan. They've, they've made it a solid 2,000 years. They're not baked, they're just mud, but uh, you know, dirt doesn't go anywhere, so it's pretty sweet. The things that might be a little bit scarier on that deterioration journey are modern materials. Some of them might be great, but we don't know. Uh, I can give you some of our best guesses, but we haven't had the luxury of time to see what actually happens as some deteriorate. 
What I'm gonna do today is tell you about the ones that we have had enough time to be scared of um, and let you know kind of what these processes look like. Um, plastics. I'm gonna do my best not to eat up all of our time on plastics, but we're gonna spend at least half of our time on plastics. Um, plastic does not automatically mean synthetic. Uh, there are organic materials that are plastics. Um, anything that was an organic material, uh, again, like organic doesn't just mean like at the grocery store, like doesn't have pesticides. Organic means it had to have been alive at one time in my world of how we use that term. Uh, if anyone saw my award-winning two-minute thesis on glue, you'll know that uh, if it grew, it's glue. Uh, anything that used to be alive, plants or animals, that's an organic material. Um, whereas synthetics or inorganics, inorganics can be rocks, um, but synthetics have to have man-made chemical changes to them. Um, most plastics are either naturally organic, we'll see here in a second that certain plants and animals just grow plastics, um, some of them are semi-synthetic, that we extract them from organic materials, and some of them are completely synthetic, that we just make them in a lab. One exception is silicone. Silicone, that like kind of rubbery substance, that is made from sand, quartz, rocks. It's one of the few inorganic uh, natural materials, semi-synthetic. All right, so plastics. There's a lot of ways to sort of organize this big concept of plastic. And um, I think one is useful of natural, semi-synthetic, synthetic. I guess that's one I was already actively using at you. Um, natural. Animals grow plastics out of their heads. Um, horn. Tortoises grow their tortoise shells. Those are plastics. Um, trees. It just kind of oozes out of them if you stick something in there. Um, saps, resins, anything that can harden and form something like amber is going to be a plastic. These are completely natural organic plastics. They've got great aging properties. Um, and then we have stuff like semi-synthetics where it starts as something natural. Um, you've got something like a lab process taking milk and making I don't know, casein can be used to make those cheap alarm clocks, like those little plastic, like, turn dial timers. That's usually made from a glass of milk. Um, so, yeah, semi-synthetics. Uh, they take and they extract these plastic properties from organic material. Um, anything that's in that cellulose range. Anybody heard of, like, celluloid while you're doing film or cellulose nitrate as an adhesive? Those come from plants, literally that cellulose that makes grass stick up. Um, so we extract those versus synthetics. Synthetics are probably everything you used to think were plastics before, I don't know, three minutes ago. Um, these are all the entirely laboratory-made synthetics. Um, PVC is polyvinyl chloride. Um, PVA, polyvinyl acetate. Um, all these polys because a polymer, which I asked you touched on super quickly there, You've got polymers, you've got these long chains of pretty long molecules, and then they all just kind of hold hands together. Um, has anybody ever played Red Rover before? You know what happens when you're holding hands and somebody comes slamming at you with, I don't know, some environmental agent. Um, yeah, so long chains are hard to keep together. Um, so that is where we get this poly word, and that's generally your cue but it's a very long chain in a category of long chains. Another super useful way that we classify plastics is thermoset and thermoplastic. So yeah, thermoplastic plastics <laughs> that contain plasticizers. Uh, all three different words, we'll get there. Um, thermoset is basically a one-way street. So you do a process to something, like you set an epoxy resin you don't get the two parts back again, right? It's a one-way street, the reaction happens, and you're done. Thermoplastics, you can melt and reform over and over again. You can make them soft, you can get them, make them stiff again, because you've got this thermoset, 
it's usually amorphous, but there's those cross links that make them rigid, that make it a one-way street. Thermoplastics, you see that it's all kind of wibbly wobbly amorphous stuff just kind of floating around next to each other. Um, this is what gives that opportunity to make something stretchy and then have it bounce back. Make something that you can melt it and reform it over and over and over again because it never sets up those hard links. Um, I use the word never loosely. So I think one-way street and two-way street is a great way to think of thermoset versus thermoplastics. And even in, I mean, art materials, you've got carriers that are set like acrylic. It's water miscible, right? You can put water in it, you can keep using it, but once it sets, the water dries out. Can you add water to finished acrylic and have it just become paint again? No, it did its thing and it's done. Versus a watercolor cake. You got a watercolor cake, you get it wet, you do some art. If you get that wet again, does it turn back into liquid paint? Yeah, we love that for some reasons and then we hate that for others. Like, I don't know, transporting your beautiful finished watercolor in a rainstorm or something. Disaster, madness. Um, so you've got those two-way streets where the same solvent will bring it back to its original state, and then you got the ones where you got one shot, and then we're done. Same way with some of these thermoset versus thermoplastic. Um, the scary ones we're gonna talk about today, I'm just going to try to hope, my, my main thesis is plastics are not forever. Um, and even in my own profession, even in museums, we house things in plastic, we bag them in plastics, you know, how many of you have made one of those albums where it's got the like sticky sheet and then you put the plastic over it and it's all your family treasured photos? <laughs> Please go home and get them out of there. <laughs> That's, I'm not gonna ask you to change your art, but I am gonna ask you to go get the heirlooms out of the plastic things. Um, plastic deteriorates at a shocking rate, um, especially those amorphous, thermoplastic, synthetic plastics. Um, they are just that moving soup and we add things to them, such as plasticizers, to change what that sort of end property looks like, like a rubber band. Um, it would be stiff if they didn't add plasticizers to the soup, but they just kind of threw some plasticizers into the soup. It's not integrated. So as that deteriorates, the bits of the soup start to come out and separate. Um, chemical reactions happen within that space. Uh, we call the worst offenders malignant plastics. Um, I think the only time malignant is used uh, is like cancer, but in museums when we talk about malignant, it has to not only be um, bad and scary, um, it has to be harmful, but not just harming itself, it also has to harm others. It is dangerous for its neighbors. And so these plastics are dangerous to anyone around them. They hurt themselves and they hurt others because of these deterioration processes cause off-gassing and weeping, chemical reactions happen, and as it kind of sounds, off-gassing vaporizes into the air. You get gases that are corrosive, toxic, poisonous. You can have gas, gas acids happen. Oh, we'll get there. I got pictures too, it's scary. Um, and you have something called weeping that happens, where you can actually get liquid byproducts coming out and running all over the place. Um, certain plastics will actually start to sweat hydrochloric or sulfuric acid. So if you see a sweaty piece of plastic and you're like, weird, it hasn't rained in here, don't touch it. <laughs> okay. Um, all right, so um, here are our top five offenders. Um, and you can see emissions. These are the byproducts that happen in that deterioration process. How long does it take? It depends on where we are and what we're doing. Um, if you are in heat, humidity, light, all of these things that basically add energy or catalysts to an environment, um, they accelerate this process. So a not air conditioned historic house in Richmond, Virginia, versus, I don't know, the cold storage that is dry, chilly North Dakota, real different speed at which things deteriorate. And I didn't pick Richmond, Virginia like out of nowhere. 
that's the Edgar Allan Poe Museum, is in a historic house in Richmond, Virginia. And it didn't have any air conditioning or climate control when I started consulting for them. All of Poe's original folios first with, are in this old sweaty house. <laughs> um, and you know, wooden furniture that's just like opaque because the humidity has gotten to the varnishes. Yeah, um, I'm gonna say it was a good time as if it was sarcastic, but I'm a conservator, it's a good time. There were just like all these problems and I was like rolling up my sleeves, like let's do this. Um, doesn't mean that you need to actively create things for me to do in your art choices. Um, all right, so cellulose nitrate, it makes acid gases and it's especially vulnerable to plasticizers just kind of falling out of suspension. Um, I think words like acetic acid, hydrochloric acid, sulfuric acid are all there. Um, those are some of the strongest acids. It doesn't mean that those are like the most dangerous to touch. I mean, they are, but it's a strong acid because, if you recall from your chemistry class, those are the ones that most efficiently make the chemical processes happen. So once you get a little bit of a strong acid, like hydrochloric acid, all of a sudden you've started to snowball, accelerate that happening. So a little bit forms and then the process just goes up 10x. Um, as you can see, a lot of them do off gassing. Um, nitrogen gases, we like to call kind of a big blanket of volatile organic compounds, which just means scary gases that get put into the air. Now, imagine if you've got some plastics either as part of an object or someone who was trying really hard to save the object, uh, put them in this safe plastic environment and then the plastic starts doing this, um, it's now harming those neighbors, right? It's now harming the very thing that we were trying to protect it from. Metals and acids are not good neighbors. Um, so you can have materials affecting other materials that are feet, meters, other side of room away because of these gases. Um, so it's not just you, it's neighbors. How can you kind of keep an eye on stuff like this already in your collection, already in your artwork, already all over your family heirloom photos? Here are some of the signs of plastic deterioration. Um, you've got smells. We're gonna talk more about smells in the next slide. Um, yellowing, getting brittle, um, ah, the stickiness. Have you ever had like a faux leather, vegan leather piece that weirdly got sticky and you know you didn't get it dirty? Or you've got a bracelet or an object that's made of one of those like harder acetates or resins um, and it's starting to get all these hairline cracks in it and you know nobody dropped it or at least you're pretty sure nobody dropped it. These are all signs of chemical deterioration. That stickiness is plasticizers oozing out of the surface of that faux leather. Um, weeping, again, weeping is literally sweating beads of off-gassed materials. Um, blistering, blooming, blooming is when stuff kind of gets that white haze about it. Um, you know, when like you get a water stain and then all the minerals from the water kind of leave that weird white ring. That happens with just the weird stuff coming out of your plastics and then kind of leaving these little hazy clouds. And it can actually be happening under the surface, so you just can't get it clean. Um, all right, let's talk smells. Um, these are kind of the main smells of you getting that off-gassing happening. Um, so if you walk into a collection or you open a book or a box and it smells like a new car um, or vomit, or vinegar, um, you are getting that off-gassing of acids and plasticizers. And that is an early to middle-ish warning sign that you need to do something about this. Um, I will tell you, in my, oh God, second year of grad school as a conservator, living in London, being very nerdy about my ancient archeological objects, and we had a seminar on plastics, and I was like, I'm an archeologist, I don't need to learn about plastics. But you know, I had to go because it was a seminar that I was in a class for. Um, and when someone mentioned that off-gassing of polyvinyl acetates and cellulose acetates smells like vomit, a family mystery was solved. My dad 
has a box of tools, and every time you open it, it smells like vomit, and he would wash all the tools, he would throw away the toolbox, he'd buy a brand new toolbox, and then like a year or two later, you'd go and open that toolbox, and it smells like somebody barfed in there. Uh, yeah, there is no cleaning in the world that could have fixed that, because we had a couple of my grandpa's tools, and they had plastic handles that have been breaking down over decades, and as soon as it started, it accelerates, and so the barf tools can never not be barf tools. It's the plastic. Um, all right, just a little bit of the fun photo here before we get to papers. Um, this is a rubber band. So you can see um, it got really brittle. It hardened because all the plasticizers came, they migrated out of that suspension. So you see that it kind of oozed them all over and then it started that embrittlement yellowing process. Um, yeah, when that happens, it's usually melted and embedded deep into the surface of whatever it was touching. So if that's some incredibly important historic document, or like your degree that you've just spent lots of money and years of your life on, yeah. Um, let's see, plasticizer migration is a big deal. Um, you've got, again, there's my stamp collection in that uh, <laughs> PVC album. Um, Hydrochloric acid comes out of polyvinyl chloride, and that's never good for anybody. So um, as those start to turn yellow, as they start to get really brittle, um, as they start to smell a bit funny, get your precious things out of them. And from now on, don't put your precious things in them in the first place. Um, also, have you ever noticed that something looks like it melted, even though you're pretty sure it never got like left in a hot car or something? That is another sign that the plasticizers have migrated out of a piece. That's supposed to be a tortoise shell jewelry box. Somebody got scammed. Um, it's plastic. Um, the other big thing that happens is cross-linking. Um, thermoplastics are supposed to have that two-way street, theoretically forever because of their molecular structure, but sometimes cross-linking can start to happen and they become one-way street. So when you thought you had choices, your choice gets taken away from you. Um, there is a, two words that can strike fear into the heart of conservators. They make us feel a deep uh, generational shame and it is soluble nylon. If we have time at the end or office hours, I will share with you what soluble nylon is and how we were fools. Um, all right, so basically, also, plastics are not indestructible. Like, they're not gonna bounce forever. Let's move on to papers, because papers are fun. Um, have you ever noticed that a 50-year-old newspaper is orange, brown, brittle, flaking, you can't move it, it's stiff as a board and just crumbles, but a 5,000-year-old parchment papyrus scroll can just get unrolled? Ah, um, acid. Acid, acid is like my full-time, like, I don't know, it's the gremlins under everything in my job. Um, acid and lignans are the things that cause tree paper to decay and other kinds of paper to not. Um, Acid-free is something that I want to uh, make you go really and look a little deeper. Um, Acid-free can mean at the moment that we packaged and manufactured this, it is technically pH neutral. No guarantee about what happens next week. Um, tree papers are naturally acidic. They have lignans in them, and these turn and deteriorate into volatile organic compounds, causing that browning, that embrittlement, um, that discoloration, how they get so hard. Um, that's from the lignin in trees. Any kind of plant that has to stand up really tall has lignin in it, uh, and lignin, is acidic. So what they do with acid-free papers often is buffer that. So they make tree paper, it's got a very low pH, it's got lots of acid, so they take something with a really high pH and neutralize it in a little soup bath and then they make the paper. This causes an internal tiny battle to chemically be happening inside that paper where eventually the buffers will break down and lose at some point. It might be next week, it might be in 50 years. It's 
going to be before 100, just saying. Um, so acid buffered means that they've just neutralized it for today, but that did not solve the problem. Um, certain materials are naturally low acid or acid free. So cotton, linen, I mean, you've seen rag paper, right? That's made of the stuff you make clothes out of. Um, that's cotton and linen rag, maybe. It might only have like 2% cotton rag in it and the rest of it's just wood paper. Um, so check your labels. Acid buffered is fine, but it's not the same as naturally acid neutral or acid free. Um, what something is made out of really matters on how it's gonna act and behave. Um, let's see, anything else about, oh, Japanese tissue. There's one, like that's a tree paper, except Japanese tissue is made, I mean, anybody used it, heard of it, needed it for stuff, yeah, it's great, we love it, uh, for two reasons. Uh, Japanese tissue is made from uh, an Asian variety of the mulberry bush, and it is from a bush. So trees have to stand up tall, so they're very hard. Bushes just kind of do their thing. They have very low lignin naturally, so it stays neutral because it already started neutral. Uh, so we use it for that archival quality, and also it can kind of take some of the heat from that buffering process. If you put a piece of Japanese tissue and your crappy lignin saturated newspaper and then a piece of Japanese tissue, it'll actually start to absorb some of that acid out of that paper and buy you some time. Um, also, Japanese tissue tends to be made in a float process where it doesn't get thrown through a paper mill at high speeds. Um, other people in this room know a heck of a lot more about the paper making process than I do, but from my perspective, the speed at which stuff gets thrown through, the fibers align. So with regular paper, um, like milled sheets of printer paper, you can rip it really easily in one direction, the way that the fibers are aligned, and then it's just a freaking nightmare to try and get a straight line out of the other side. Uh, Japanese tissue also has very long fibers, and that's one of its best qualities. So it is not run through at speed, so the fibers are never aligned. So it's tough to tear in a straight line in any direction, but it also means that you get the strength of that fiber. Um, all right, we are rolling down. In general, I can't tell you about everything to be afraid of with, not afraid of, every decision that you would need to make about those basement materials, foundations, canvases, boards, papers, but it's a good idea to consider what you're putting on top of it as part of that decision-making process. Um, I'm a big fan of pairing like with like. Um, something that moves and changes and morphs and warps like wood or vellum or parchment or these organic materials, they do a lot of moving around. So if you put something really, really rigid on top of them, that tensile tug of war is going to break your artwork down. So pairing like with like, something that doesn't really move or change or shift in environment with something else that doesn't really move or change or shift, or pick two things that just do stuff all the time and then they can do stuff and dance together. Uh, here, that's a early map of London, about 400 years old, made out of different stitched pieces of parchment, animal skin parchment. So it's a vellum. Uh, with animal skin, with leather, when it gets humid, it gets floppy, it gets, it expands, it gets bigger in like every direction. Um, so how do we mount it in a way that we're not causing that push-pull to be happening with a glue? We don't use glue, that's what. Um, I am sewing it to this board with linen thread. Uh, linen fibers are really long and when they get humid, they get fat. So they get shorter because their length gets kind of sucked up by getting fat when they get humid. So if it gets humid, this map will get floppy, but the linen will get fat and shrink. So as it dries out, the linen will lengthen out again and that vellum will shrink. So they play very well together. They have opposite attract kind of, uh, I don't know, it's just a match made in heaven. Uh, but again, natural fiber, natural fiber. If I was dealing with something rigid, I would go for something else that was very rigid. Um, finally, uh, carriers. 
why pay two or three times as much for that Sakura Micron to be signing your artwork when like Sharpies are cheap and everywhere? I mean, you do you, but the reason is um, acidity in materials or metals in materials, and a lot of inks have metal in them, uh, you're getting to inherit all of those deterioration processes that are going to affect your base materials. This is iron gall ink. It was made from iron and wine vinegar, so like acid and metal. Uh, very popular ink for several centuries. It eats the paper. So you just get the holes where the letters were. Um, I'm not saying Sharpies are as bad as iron gall ink, but like they're in the same family. All right, so what I want from you is just to read your labels and be aware. Um, think about what the staying power of your artwork is. Um, how long do you want it to last? Uh, if it's gonna be a piece of ephemera where the whole point of it is it changes and breaks down and falls apart and you only get one shot at this experience, cool. Um, I would say, you know, I add the like dollars and cents economics of it of if it's gonna fall apart in three weeks, then a museum collection might not wanna buy it, but you know, Mark Quinn did that uh, self-portrait where he sculpted his face out of his own frozen blood. So that piece has to continuously be in a generating freezer environment. And it's also a biohazard waiting to happen of eight pints of human blood. Um, it got bought at Sachi's for 1.4 million pounds. So like, not necessarily a deal breaker, I guess, but you know he made those choices as an artist, his intent and his choices on materials, he made them and that is what I'm after for all of you. Um, consider storage needs and environment and I guess soluble nylon, if I've got two minutes to share a deep dark shame of my career's field. Um, don't be the first, <laughs> like I had a I don't know, very pessimistic friend when I was going to school in Boston who was like, never attend the first annual at anything if you ever wanna have like cred. Um, I think that that's not the right attitude about being a trailblazer. But when it comes to materials, early adoption and just believing the hype that it's forever and magical and solves all your problems, um, learn from all of us who have seen dozens of wonder technology breakthroughs that'll solve all your problems. And so why do we keep needing new ones if the other ones solved all the problems? They didn't. Um, it doesn't mean to be scared of them, but it means to know what you're getting into. Um, new materials are fun and exciting, but don't rely on them to do what they do in their package. We have ways, it's called audi testing, where we make the nastiest, grossest, most deteriorating environment we possibly can, and we check to see what happens 30 days in an oven in a test tube that's wet. We put water at the bottom. We put zinc and copper and iron tabs in there so that it's getting all this like metal corrosion, off-gassing stuff, and we leave it there for 28 days. And then when we bring it out, we've got this sort of artificial guess at a couple decades of deterioration in 28 days. It's not exact. It might hold up to an Audi test for 28 days, but it didn't actually make it the 50 years we thought it would. Only actual real time in real environments will tell. Uh, soluble nylon, it was the wonder adhesive. It was this thermoplastic that you could put on, and yes, it's made of nylon, so it's really strong, but you could melt it down and it's water soluble, soluble nylon. Um, it was alcohol soluble, so like really not scary solvents, and you could retreat objects, you just put it in there, it's clear. No one will ever see it, and if you need it out to be able to research or test on that object, you just have to use a little water or alcohol, and it dissolves right out, and it's good as new. Uh, soluble nylon was used on probably thousands of objects across Europe, the United States, Canada, um, in the 1960s and 70s, and by the late 80s, early 90s, it had cross-linked and just basically become hard, rigid, nasty, webs of plastic that we will never be able to get out of those ancient objects. Um, so ruined literally thousands of objects because it was new, it was innovative, it was safe, it was soluble, um, but time told a different story. Uh, 
So stuff that's been around for a real long time, it may have some deterioration properties, but at least we know what they are. It's the devil you know in it. Um, and new materials are exciting, but know what you're getting into. All right. Um, questions? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about plexiglass. Yeah. Um, plexiglass is a great thermoset plastic. Um, we use it quite a lot for mounts. It's not part of that actively malignant group um, because I guess its aging properties are good enough <laughs> that it can be in direct contact with objects. Um, that doesn't mean that it doesn't scratch very easily, that it isn't inherently very brittle. Um, and as it deteriorates, it doesn't discolor as it gets brittle. So that means we don't get any warning signs before it cracks and breaks and drops an object. So we have to be very vigilant that like it still looks good, but it's actually starting to become more fragile. Um, we can actually just Basically, a little needle and a ball peen hammer to just sort of like check what kind of reverberation we're getting off of it. So we have like basically a music tuner and we tap at it and we punch into it. And if the waves are getting shorter, that means it's getting harder. Um, and so once that difference is charted far enough, we call it. So you showed the rubber band and you said that the plasticizers have all leached out of it and it kind of melts. What's left? Like what is that rubber band now? Um, you've got that polyvinyl acetate and it breaks down into those individual components. Um, the chemical changes happen. Um, so you've still got all of those long chain molecules that have broken into smaller chains, cross length, made themselves into something else and then they're just sitting there. So the soup, I don't know, the soup solidifies after a bunch of stuff leaks out of it. <laughs> Other questions? Mike, are you thinking deep thoughts about some of the choices you've already made? Okay, so like oil on canvas paintings, like how long does that last without like varnish? Or do you need a varnish for that? Um, we like to protect surfaces and that one is a big dust issue. Um, dust gets onto the surface of anything um, and it's made of heaven knows what, but usually like human skin. Um, and so you've got this material that will eventually kind of bring humidity to the surface of whatever the object, especially oil painting, same as a piece of ceramic. Um, and so that moisture in that sort of organic and inorganic soup of powder uh, starts to cause chemical reactions and it'll actually embed into the surface of something. Um, so having to clean dust, another catch-22 thing that we all argue about in conservation endlessly, to dust something is to mechanically, uh, like you're scraping at it, you're damaging it on a microscopic level every time you dust. But if you leave that dust on there, you're creating this environment for chemical reactions and embedding that in and pretty soon you can't dust it off. Um, so where's the balance there? Uh, varnishes are that sacrificial skin that if we scrape it up or it starts to break down with the dust, you can remove and revarnish without damaging the artist's intent of the painting underneath. So it's a sacrificial layer that we let life happen to. And another thing from the viewer's side with the dust is that if it's unvarnished and difficult to clean, it, it becomes dirtier and hard, hard to see and experience. So. How long do acrylic paintings last? Um, it's too soon to tell. <laughs> um, acrylics, I know from your perspective, you're like, nah, acrylics, but from conservation perspective, we're like, I don't know, that's really new. Um, we have acrylics uh, paintings in many, many collections. Um, and like, 
they're doing great so far. We're aware of sort of plastic deterioration mechanisms, so the environments that we keep them in, um, we've got a pretty good idea of that, but we just haven't had enough time since that technology has been invented to really know what's gonna happen. Amanda, could you speak to your interests as a young student or like an undergrad or high school, or how do you ever, how did you get into kind of this discipline? It's gonna be a hard, nerdy moment here. I um, so I think the what do you wanna be when you grow up thing from first grade said archeologist, and then when we went to go pick that up when they were destroying old records from Minot Public Schools, the lady was like, oh, and what are you now? And I'm like, an archeologist, <laughs> very single-minded. <laughs> um, and I still, I love archeology, span I love the excavations. Weirdly, I'm fine sleeping on dirt floors and being afraid of the drinking water. Um, but the objects were the highlight for me. And honestly, in the broad scale conceptually of archeology, span we're turning that dirt into paperwork and objects are just kind of informing that broader archeological record. I care about the archeological record because I'm being recorded right now, but like the objects, and what happens to them and how much we can learn from them, the research potential, the aesthetics of understanding how cool people used to be and that progress is not linear was my favorite part of even the Fort Clark excavations when I was a wee teenager um, in North Dakota. I didn't full on lie about my age, but I definitely wasn't in college yet. <laughs> but uh, by the time they found out, I was already like quite good at the job, so they were fine with it. Um, so, yeah, by the time I graduated with my degree in archaeology, I already kind of went back and said, I want to be a conservator. And my archaeology professors were like, ooh, that's going to be a problem. Uh, you need art. You need all of these physical techniques. I needed chemistry and organic chemistry, which I had neither because I was an archaeologist. Um, and I needed painting, drawing, life drawing, Sculpture, I had to take like nine or 10 art classes before I could qualify for graduate school in conservation. And when I got to London, I was the only archeologist in my program. There were a dozen of us, there were a couple chemists, but there were maybe six of, half the group was artists. Uh, and they had the skills, uh, they had those fine technique skills. And once we learned sort of the ethics and things after a year or two, you get thrown out of the program if you don't have the fine hand skills. You have to do a scalpel test where they have a uh, ultra fine line. It's like a 32 point line that they make a circle or some weird amorphous non-angular shape out of and you get a number 10 rounded scalpel blade and you have to cut that without using a microscope or a magnifying glass or any other aids and then they put it under the microscope and ink has to be on both sides of your cut or else you don't get to play anymore. <laughs> um, so you guys are actually very much in a better position to pursue conservation and I did archeological conservation because I'm an archeologist. Modern art conservation is a huge field um, and you are developing those techniques as well as those ethical and curatorial choices as you're making your own creations that are what are valued in my profession. We have time for one more. <laughs> Back to Sarah. I'm curious about erasers. Yeah. Well, the softer the eraser, the less time you have with it in your life. Anybody already notice with those gummy foamable erasers that like you buy a bunch of them because they were on sale and they're expensive and then you pull a couple out from your drawer a couple years later and they're just not quite so moldable anymore. Um, not to any degree for you to be concerned about, ish. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you use one that is already breaking down, it's already gotten harder, it's already kind of getting a crust on it, like pink erasers that get hard, you're gonna be putting more volatile compounds onto your art. So like fresh erasers are your friends and they are, they are not possessions, they are experiences. Throw them away, like toothbrushes. You don't keep the same toothbrush for yeah, erasers. All right. 
Thank you very much. Before you leave, you got to turn in your plastic. So we're going to get in a line. Everybody's, <laughs> everybody's going to dump it in a bucket, and uh, we'll be plastic free when you exit. Have a good week. Have a good. Have a good plastic free weekend. Of course.